<laughs> so um, it's going to be hard for me to monitor the chat while I'm presenting, I think. So I think people should feel free to speak up if there's something really confusing, confusing or interesting to mention. And we are at the bottom of the hour right now. Yeah, I think you can go ahead and get started. Thanks. Okay, well, great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for hanging in there until the very end of the day. So I'm Bob Horton. I'm a data scientist with a little consulting company called Wind Vector. But I used to be a regular scientist. Uh, my, my PhD is in biomedical science and molecular biology. Um, and the topic today is, um, well, both this technical concept of, of a concept vector for semantic search, and then the application area is going to be on um, open medical literature from PubMed Central and uh, metadata from PubMed. So I have with me, um, actually, John Mount couldn't make it, but uh, Jerry Law should be joining us shortly, and Catherine Gundling are our subject matter experts who will talk about why such these models that we're going to talk about might actually be useful. <clears throat> so I've got two kind of overview slides. One is the sort of technical concepts I want to cover, um, and that breaks down into these four ideas. One is we really want to have some familiarity with what semantic embeddings are and what you use them for. So these are very popular, especially I think now, because when people do retrieval augmented generation, they're usually talking about um, finding things with semantic indexing, which all depends on these semantic embeddings. So basically what an embedding is, it's a deep learning model that's able to take some uh, passage of text and uh, represent it as a fixed length numeric vector. And what that does is it um, it simplifies a lot of natural language processing by turning things into geometry problems. Most of these semantic embedding vectors are written in such a way that similar ideas will get similar vectors. So you can search for similarity in the, in the space of meaning, the semantic space, by looking at sim similarity of the vectors. That's, that's what most people use embeddings for. <laughs> But it turns out that they also make pretty good machine learning uh, uh, predictive features. So we can do prediction on the embeddings also. And those two ideas turn out to be related because when we take uh, logistic regression models or linear models, the oldest kind of machine learning models, and we give it the newest kind of features, the semantic embeddings, we get something interesting, which is the these models learn a coefficient for every element in that um, in that feature vector, which means they learn exactly the same number of coefficients as there are dimensions in the vector. And we can represent those coefficients as a vector. And it turns out we can then use that ver vector to look for the similar things in the in the semantic space. Only, only the vector of coefficients in the model doesn't recognize just a single example, which is how people normally do semantic searches by example. It's recognizing a category of things that we trained a model to recognize. So that's why we're calling these concept vectors. <laughs> and the other aspect of this is that we don't really have to use the, the model. All we need is the coefficients from the model. So we're really treating the model as data and we're reframing the idea of predictive scoring as a similarity search. So now it's a database thing. It's not, it's not, um, it's not a computational thing necessarily. And the really cool thing there is that this idea of similarity search is scalable because of all the fast approximate nearest neighbor algorithms that um, people are inventing and deploying these days. So we'll, we'll show how to do that, how to use those concept vectors for searching in a big database. <laughs> um, another technical topic here is the idea of label mining. So um, we're gonna be using open access uh, biomedical articles from PubMed Central, which are all very well structured, including um, having uh, section headings that were written by the authors. So the section headings are basically metadata telling about the topics of the following paragraphs. 
So we're going to try to use that as a way to find labels to find categories of paragraphs. <clears throat> and the other way we're going to try to find uh, labels is by uh, looking at the mesh terms that were applied to articles. And then finally, the big purpose of all this is that we want to we want to see if we can learn models basically where the light is good on this really well annotated and structured PubMed central data, and then use those models possibly in other places. So this the sequence of things in the outline here, um, I'm going to start with a little bit of introductory material talking about machine learning models and, and the PubMed data. And then we'll go through a mini demo because it's supposed to be a hands-on thing. And unfortunately, I can't give you can't give everybody access to the database where we're running uh, the PJ vector stuff on, but we do have a mini demo that you can download from GitHub and run it on your own laptop. So we'll try to spend most of the time today on this mini demo. And then um, Jerry will come in and talk about this idea of uh, developing and refining section heading patterns that to basically engineer the labels to give us the models that we're looking for. <laughs> I'll talk give some examples of how these ideas scale up on the on the database backend, especially using this PG vector extension on Postgres. And then um, Catherine will talk about uh, some of these mesh term predictors and how we can uh, assess them for which ones seem to be doing what we expect and which ones don't. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking here for a few minutes, but while I'm doing this, everybody should go download the mini demo um, stuff. Now. What you have to do is go to github.com slash rmhorton slash PMC classifiers. And then once you get there, then the links will be available. So th this is that website. So github.com rmhorton PMC classifiers. <clears throat> and the mini demo stuff is in the mini demo directory. And there's two ways to download this. You can do it the hard way or you can do it the easy way. And the easy way is to click that link to the Google Drive and that'll give you a zip file. The hard way is to get all the files out of GitHub itself, which um, believe me, if the Google Drive thing works for you, do that, do it that way. So what that will do is, is download these, these uh, demo data files. So it's actually hard to put data on GitHub because they have pretty strict limits on how big a file can be. So I broke this data into five files that are each small enough to be hosted on GitHub. And these are all just, RDS files, just serialized R data files, <clears throat> where the um, all the text has already been featureized. So they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty big. They're twenty megs a piece, and that's why you need to get started on this download right away. All right. So while everybody's downloading, I'm going to keep talking. Everybody's probably familiar with PubMed, the the free database basically access to um, Medline uh, that's run by the National Library of Medicine. Uh, one of the other as one of the other projects they have at NLM is PubMed Central, which is not just an indexing of the existing literature, but an, an archive of freely available uh, open access articles. So that's the main data set that we're using as we downloaded, I think my once I got it in my database, it's pretty close to a terabyte of information from PubMed Central plus annotations from PubMed. I put the notice that no librarians were harmed because we're not. Our goal is not really to um, put any librarians out of work. Our goal is to use these models that we train on this data, um, probably in other um, uh, use transfer learning to to use them in other circumstances. It's it'd be a pretty hard bar to try to actually search PubMed better. So I don't want to get everybody's expectations up there, but hopefully we'll be able to come up with models that we find useful for other purposes. And we, we might find stuff in PubMed too. And we're not against it. We just don't want to make that promise. Okay, this is, I promise this is the only three lines of Python code I'm going to show you. This is how I did this, those embeddings. So in, in those data sets that you're downloading, those embeddings came from this um, Python sentence transformer model. Um, I Embeddings are kind of a moving target. So I haven't spent a lot of time trying to find the best possible embedding because uh, that's going to change from week to week. Um, a lot of people use the open AI embeddings that, or other web service um, based um, 
processes to get your embeddings. Um, and I think these ideas about embeddings should apply even if you don't, even if you don't use exactly the same embedding. So this is what the data looks like um, that we've, once we've loaded it from PubMed Central and done the embeddings, we get these tables where every, um, every row in this table is a paragraph, except for the first row is always the title of the, of the article. And then all the other rows are paragraphs in the article and they all have these section headings. Uh, so for example, here, there are two paragraphs in the introduction. So both of these paragraphs have that same section heading introduction. You can see this this one is a, a medical article. And I wanted to show two of them because the second one is actually not a medical article. It, this is about detecting explosives. Right, so there's all kinds of stuff in PubMed Central that that's not just medical. The other thing that I wanted to point out here is that the reason it's called a section path instead of just a section heading is that you might have subsections. And, and when you do, I just concatenate the whole path down to that subsection. So here we have two paragraphs for this. So it's the first subsection inside results and discussion, which is sensor characterization and solutions. So the two paragraphs there, and then the next paragraph after that is a different subsection. So that's why it's called a section path. So we want to point out that there's a lot of information that are that is captured in those section headings, that, that whole path of section headings, that tells us what the text is about. So that's it's almost like a kind of labeling that people have already done. And we just need to polish it up a little bit to use it for machine learning. So this is the format our data is in. This is the format we want it to be in. So this is just the, I'm sorry, I don't know why my <laughs> images keep flashing off and on, but um, we want to have, uh, what we call rectangular data, where every every row is a case or an example, and every column is something that we know about that example. And most of the columns here are blue because they're the features of the example, and the special one is the red one, which is the one we try to predict. So, so the blue ones are the predictive features, and the red one is the label. Um, typically, the label is the hard thing to come by, right? So, if if you imagine you were running a data gathering exercise one summer measuring flower parts and trying to associate that with species. You could probably have your undergraduate summer assistants do all the measuring of the how long the sepals are and so forth, but you need your expert botanist to give us the label and tell us what species that is. So usually the label captures some kind of expert human judgment. So we'll, with our data, we already know what we want for the labels. So very commonly in machine learning, you spend most of your time trying to engineer features. We already know what we want for the features. Our features are just the embedding um, dimensions. So in this case, we have 768 numbers. I've only shown you the first five. There's a whole bunch more. And then on top of that, we've come up with some labels, which are just binary. Like, is this row a title or not? Is this in the results section or not? Does it mention statistics or not? So that's the format we want it in. And what we're going to do is we're going to predict a separate model for each of these red columns. So these are the patterns um, we're starting out with. These are just simple little regular expression patterns. And um, most of these are just about what, what parts of the article is it? Like, is it a title, results, discussion, or whatever? Um, but the one we're going to dive in deeper to is this one called adverse events, because we want a model that can dis that can tell us whether a paragraph of text discusses um, unintended side effects of drugs. And those are typically labeled, or very commonly, they're labeled in a um, part of the results called, called adverse events or something like that. So in this case, we're just doing the simplest pattern for that. We're just looking for the word adverse in the section heading, and we'll see how well that works. And then, and then we'll iteratively improve that pattern and see if we can make it better. All right, so does everybody have the mini demo downloaded? Anybody have it downloaded? I'm going to switch to the mini demo here, and I'm just going to give you some caveats. First of all, it occurs to me that if you have a really slow computer, it might be a really bad idea to just run this whole demo 
while you're trying to connect to Zoom on that same computer. Um, sorry, I just got a new laptop and I am get kind of cocky about it. My laptop has 12 cores. And if yours doesn't, you're going to have to change some things before you run this. Um, so you may have to install some of these libraries. <clears throat> and then um, these, these are two functions that actually come from the PG Vector website, because in R, you have to be able to serialize and unserialize the vectors. Um, so they're serialized basically by just concatenating all the numbers into a string and unserialized by splitting that back out into numbers. <clears throat> uh, when you load those the data, and we're going to put three of those files into the training set and, and one for the test set. <clears throat> and then we're going to pull out the uh, the vector of or the the matrix of uh, just the 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 vectors by unserializing them and then binding all those rows into a matrix. And we'll do that separately for the train and the test sets. And then these are the patterns. If your if your computer is not very fast, you should probably comment out some of these patterns in the middle um, because we're gonna have to fit a one model for each pattern. And then when you finally um, run the models, this is a um, just a poor man's caching. I, I save the models into a file um, rather than using the caching from, from the R markdown um, knit machinery. I, I save it myself so that I can I can train the models by walking through the um, notebook or by or by knitting it either way. It's just that when you do this, you have to remember if you ever want to retrain these models, you have to go back and delete that file first. <clears throat> uh, so this is basically the correlation amongst these different models that I've already trained it, and you can see that some of this stuff makes sense. For, so, for example, results in discussion have. Um, um, some overlap, right? Let's see, so results, oh, okay. Adverse events are usually in the results. So so adverse events actually has a high score for results. And then, um, let's see, discussion and introduction are have also pretty high correlation. So they're pretty similar kinds of ideas. Um, so when we plot the ROC curves for those models, um, it looks like we hit a home run on the adverse events because it's almost perfect. But it turns out that um, you know if you actually count how many cases there were in the training and test sets, um, there were only 23 out of some tens of thousands of possible paragraphs that were marked adverse events in the test in the training set, and only two in the test set. So this is really not a statistically solid ROC curve. So the real the real curve is not as good as 1.0. <clears throat> and then we can look at some examples of what what do those models find? And I specifically want to look for that adverse events um, model because that's the one that we actually have a plan for that. We want to use it for something. So these are some examples of the high scoring passages in the test set that that model found. And if you read these. Um, you can tell that most of these really are about adverse events. Um, so in, in this case, they're talking about hematologic toxicity, anemia, lymphopenia, neutropenia. So, but it's so these are adverse events of some kind of drug trial, but it's not labeled. It, notice it doesn't say adverse events in the section heading. It says safety. So that's like a synonym. There's a different way of saying it that we wouldn't have found out. We never would have found this paragraph if we had just been looking for things that talk about adverse events. But by training the model and then using the model to kind of expand the coverage, we're able to find these other things like safety. In fact, um, most of these other sections were not found by our, um, uh, by our pattern. In fact, none of these top six were found by our pattern. Um, so one of them says study assessments. And clearly it's talking about adverse events because it says adverse events were graded for severity according to these criteria, right? So, so it is, the model was correct. This is an adverse events related paragraph, but the label would not have found it on its own.
All right. So um, one of the reasons I wanted you to have that little demo is that, um, you know, it's got a small but still fairly substantial set of uh, data that you can try your own patterns in. So you, you can try to find other things. If you think about the ones we've found, um, we have a model that can, to some degree, tell the difference between results and discussion. So we often have to, um, like if we're thinking about trying to summarize scientific data or summarize a, a study, we want to probably pay attention to whether you're pulling things from the paper about that study that were actually learned in that study or whether you're finding things where they're talking about somebody else's work. Right? So that, that ability to distinguish the results section of a paper from the discussion section of the paper might be really useful there. <clears throat> so that's a... That's a very different idea to distinguish results from discussion than to, to say, to find adverse events versus um, uh, maybe sections on other things like, like what, what kind of patients were chosen for a study. And, and you can imagine training models for many, many different things like that just by finding appropriate patterns in the, in the section headings. <clears throat> All right, so let's see, Jerry, are you with us yet? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay, you want to uh, take over and talk about um, th these uh, um, engineering the labels for finding the adverse events uh, model? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, um, oh, Bob, you could have kept the, the screen up. Uh, I was just going to use yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll do it again. All right, perfect. So hi everyone. Um, thank you, Bob, for the introduction from before. So uh, my name is Jerry Lau. I am a trained uh, pharmacist by training and I am with the Factomai group. Uh, essentially just a brief background, uh, Factomai is a industry group uh, composed of mo a multitude of pharmaceutical companies, think Pfizer, uh, Eli Lilly, et cetera. And basically uh, we are composed of specific medical information departments within those organizations. And we all collaborate together in terms of creating best practices and advancing the field of medical information. And so uh, Bob, next slide. One of the things that we do in medical information is cre create scientific response documents, uh, abbreviated for SRDs for short. And essentially what SRDs are, are it's the pharmaceutical industry's response to unsolicited in inquiries from healthcare providers. So think uh, questions that healthcare providers can find online or in the label, they go and ask the manufacturer directly. And so uh, what the manufacturer provides is this specific document that answers that provider's question to the best of their uh, ability. And these documents are non-promotional, uh, they're evidence-based, so based on clinical research, based on clinical studies, uh, whether that be uh, publicly available, such as in PubMed or internal resources as well, and they're scientifically balanced. So it's not skewed towards one side. So even we ha in these documents, we present like, you know, even if it's not flattering to for the product, we still present pre uh, present it other uh, anyways. And so these documents conform with internal procedures and with the FDA guidance on responding to unsolicited, unsolicited requests for off-label information. And so we're a nonprofit and we worked with Bob in terms of exploring this exciting new realm. Uh, next slide, Bob. And yeah, so basically what uh, happened is that earlier in, a, in our earlier years, Factomai developed uh, best practices guidelines on creating these documents. And uh, we extended this research into creating a rubric. And now the, uh, the intended rubric um, was basically, uh, let me backtrack. The rubric was to help quantitati uh, quantitatively evaluate a, a response document based on the best practices recommended by Factomai. And this rubric was in originally intended for human evaluation. So for human to use that rubric and then evaluate a scientific response document and assign it a score based on specific criteria on how well it did in those criteria, et cetera. And so what we wanted to do was take that rubric and use it as a framework 
for having computers evaluate the scientific response to that thing. So not just having human evaluators, but seeing how well do computers evaluate SRDs. And so our overarching goal for this whole project, um, or one of our one of our overarching goals, uh, is to have a tool that can help human writers develop scientific response documents in a more efficient manner. And so recently, Fact of Mind did a survey uh, on um, from a multitude of organizations, and a big thing. And I just I know it's not on the slide, but I just wanted to highlight it is that people were really struggling, uh, not struggling, but a very big time commitment was used to, you know, look through a clinical study, find the permanent information, and then being able to paraphrase and synthesize that into the SRD. And so really looking uh, into ways such as this project, where we can have a tool that can help human writers just make it, have an easier time developing these uh, documents. Uh, next slide, Bob. And so uh, this is just a quick uh, snapshot. Uh, very, this is not the whole rubric. This is just part of the rubric. And we thought that some of the rubric criteria might be addressable with classifiers. So if you see in the in the rectangular orange boxes there, I know it's kind of hard to read, but I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just read it out. Um, so basically, in the first box, we have summarization of clinical trials. So think study design, think uh, adverse events, think population. Uh, so these criteria can be addressable with classifiers. And so that's how we try to approach the problem. And uh, next slide, Bob. And so uh, I'll hand it over to Bob to talk about more about the performance of these models. So remember we were, we were looking for patterns in the section headings to see if we can capture just the sections that are talking about what we're looking for and not other things. And here we've um, basically tried a bunch of different patterns. So you remember in our first pass through this, we found some other things that might be synonyms for adverse events like safety. And we also found um, other um, documents that had this kind of material under tolerability or, or, or even toxicity. So we wanna find out if there's some combination of those things that will give us a better model. So in this case, um, because it's a problem we've been working on for some time, we already had a test set where we got some of our subject matter experts to hand label a bunch of um, sentences or paragraphs for us. So we, we basically know what the answer is. And that way we're able to try these models on this, um, this standard test set and we can compare the models to each other. So one thing I, so these models are actually trained on a much bigger data set than, than what the mini demo uses. Um, and in fact, um, because you remember the adverse events tag was pretty rare in our original data set. And, but we have access to a huge data set, right? So one of the things that you can do when you have a big data set, even if you're not doing big data models or, or whatever, is you can, often just look through that big data set and find the small data set you actually want to use, a small custom data set. So for these models, we custom um, selected a, a different data set for each model for the training data. And that made it really hard. Like, if you do that, how are you going to compare them to each other? And the answer is, well, we're comparing them all on the same test data. So it's all the same test data, but every model was trained on its own its own uh, training set. So that way, if if one of these one of these patterns is rare, that's okay. We're looking through millions of documents. We'll still find the 500 or so examples of documents that do have this pattern. And we'll use those for our, our, our training set. And then once we've trained all the models, we'll just test them all on the same test set. <laughs> and I highlighted in in orange here, the, the best AUC we've gotten. Um, and I have the previous prefix this by saying that we spent a lot of time doing labeling on Prodigy, having our experts look at stuff, and we never got an AOC above about 0.84 at that time. But here, fairly easily, we we're able to get a better AOC than that, and we haven't finished yet. We might we may be able to improve this uh, further. So it's a pretty um, uh, relatively simple and effective way to come up with a variety of different kinds of models. I think, and and uh, I hope people will consider this kind of approach 
um, if you have to build some text classifiers. Okay, so um, we advertised Postgres, so I have to say something about it. We haven't haven't done any Postgres yet, so I just I'll just show a couple of really quick slides here. Um, we can push a lot of logic into the database. So here um, uh, shows a few um, SQL functions running in the in the database, and these are just about finding. Um, paragraphs that match patterns. So um, in this case, there's a special overloaded operator in uh, Postgres for matching a pattern to a, a POSIX regular expression. Um, so that's what we're using here to, to go through and find all the paragraphs matting, matching a given pattern. And furthermore, you can call functions from other functions, or in this case, we're actually making a procedure, which is just like a function line, it doesn't return a value. So we have this procedure that's gonna add a new pattern. So every pattern gets a name. Like if you remember uh, our, our, our first adverse events pattern, we called it AE1, and then we tried some variations on it that just each get a different name. So they all get a name, and then we can register that with this add pattern procedure. And that's gonna go through and call this other function and find all the paragraphs that match the pattern and put all those matching um, uh, results into a table. So it's going to take the PubMed ID and the paragraph number, which are the two keys you need to identify any given paragraph, and then the pattern name. And we already know the pattern because the pattern name is, goes in a different table into this pattern table. So that's all we need to know where any given pattern is. So we know that in this in this article, on this paragraph number, then this pattern name was found. Um, and then, so, so we're keeping the pattern paragraph. We're also keeping another table where we're saying which articles match that pattern. Uh, so it's a little shorter table. It just says that some paragraph within this article match the pattern. And then uh, we keep, um, the, the pattern itself. And all of that is managed by, by this function. That we, and then we just can call the function from R. Um, so now we have this whole um, collection of patterns and we just call that procedure to add the pattern for every pattern. And uh, it will get the database server to do all the work. Um, <clears throat> So this is a function to get those. I told you there were um, custom data sets for every pattern. And, and this is how that does that. We, we pick a certain number of articles that match the pattern ID. Then we get all the paragraphs from those articles and uh, join it with the embeddings and return a, a data set that's ready to train a model on. Um, so just coming back to that idea that we, we, we compared all the different models that way. And I just need to show you a little bit of code that uses vectors. So um, remember the, the regular expression had this special tilde operator to compare a POSIX regular expression. Well, vectors have, um, uh, there's a family of different operators and you can read about it on the PG vector documentation on GitHub if, if you're interested. But the one with, that we're using is the inner product operator. And that's this uh, less than sign and a, and a a pound sign and then greater than that that operator means takes the inner product of two vectors so i have to apologize for naming all my vector columns vector which is a little confusing because there's also a data type named vector so sometimes when i say vector i mean the column and sometimes i mean the data type um, it does not confuse sql but it confuses humans but but when we want to find the similarity between these two vectors or, or actually the inner product okay one thing I didn't tell you is that all these vectors from this particular embedder are unit length. And when vectors are unit length, that means that the inner product is the same as the cosine similarity. So we're, we're computing the similarity between the embedding vector for a particular example and the embedding vector for one of these models. So here we've, we've got this adverse events model number eight, AE8. And, and we compute that similarity. So, so we're gonna 
for every example, we're going to compute its similarity to the adverse events model and then to the toxicity model. And the purpose here is that we want to find out if, um, uh, see if this will let us find examples where the toxicity model finds stuff that does not look like adverse events. Because when we look through a few examples, actually we're able, this is pretty clear that toxicity pattern finds all kinds of things that are not about um, adverse events. They might be studying cytotoxicity or something. And, and so this is just another way to kind of focus in on the differences between two models. So this plot just shows for 2000 different paragraphs, what is its score from one model versus another model. And then we're interested in looking at the ones where those models differ. So we just um, subtracted the two scores and found the ones that are, have the highest difference between the two um, things. And then we can look at those to try to find uh, examples where um, one tag might give us something we we don't want, and if and if 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 we know that, then we can try to avoid it. We might, in this case, we just decided, decided not to use the toxicity um, tag at all or the toxicity pattern at all. It was, we we were better off without it. Okay, so um, I did want to point out that um, this is all one way of finding labels. The other way is just to use the mesh terms, the medical subject headings that are uh, already in the um, in PubMed, and we use those for labels. <laughs> um, so this is just an example of how we can um, uh, search for uh, all right. We I, not shown here, right? Um, because I promised I would not show you any more Python. We trained like a thousand mesh term models in Python. And then I put them in the database. So they're all in a table. Um, and, and that table is called descriptor model data. So now we can go back and, and pick out a paragraph. And I just arbitrarily chose one um, article that, and the only criterion I applied here was that it had to have just a single paragraph for the abstract. And then I want to see which mesh terms match this abstract the best, right? So we pick out, uh, write some SQL to um, pull up the paragraph based on this PubMed ID and the, and, the, and the paragraph number, and then also go into the embedding table and pull out the embedding for that same paragraph. And then we give that embedding here, and this is, this is we're just manipulating some text to generate the SQL. So we're going to, we're going to put the embedding, just the string version that um, serialized string version of the embedding vector. Uh, we're going to plug it into a SQL query, and we're going to use that comparison operator to compare it to the beta unit vector, which is that coefficient vector from one of these models. Or actually, from this is a, actually a column. So we've got a thousand models in this table, and every one of them has a beta unit vector. So we're going to compare this query vector to the whole column of beta unit vectors. And then we're going to um, order it by the ones that have the best score, which is which is this comparison between those things. And this is what it came out with. So this is the the paragraph talking about postal structures and surf and and uh, basically the behavior of waves and mechanical stresses and stuff. And these are the top um, tags that it picked out. Number one was mechanical stress conservation of natural resources, computer simulation. If you look here, it says numerical model. So it really was a computer simulation. So those first three, the highest scoring ones really look like they were appropriate match terms for this abstract. But the fourth one doesn't because it's not, it's really about coastal stuff. It's not about rivers. It's not about water pollutants. So basically the lesson here is uh, twofold. So there's the technical lesson, which is, our models are data now. We're just searching through these mesh term models as though they're data, and, and we never have to run a model prediction algorithm to do it. All we're doing is searching by vector similarity, and we're finding the mesh terms that are predicted to have the highest score for this paragraph. So we can technically do it. The real complication is these models aren't perfect. They often, they will make mistakes. And I think these are some examples that, um, how how would we know just by looking at these scores? Because these scores are really close. And the first three are actually probably correct, and the next two are not. Um, so this um, the the problem with this kind of uh, 
machine learning is that it gives you these fuzzy answers and we don't always know where to put the, the cutoffs. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our next subject matter expert who's gonna talk about um, looking at these mesh terms and trying to figure out if the ones that we're predicting are appropriate for particular uh, medical applications. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Gundling, and I work at University of California, San Francisco. I've been a clinical immunologist for many years, an academic physician there. And most recently, I've taken a deep dive into a field we call now climate medicine and its association with really with exacerbation of the challenges we already have in patient care related to health equity. However, today I am what I have learned is a new label for myself called a SME, a subject matter expert, um, because I use PubMed and medical databases all the time looking for information to both help me practice medicine, as well as to research um, whatever topic I'm looking at and possibly uh, conducting a clinical trial or writing a paper with someone. So these databases are hugely important and any advance in helping us to make them better would just be a great advance in medicine. So what we're going to do today is um, take a look at some of these models and make some observations. So the first thing we'll do now is to look at one selected mesh term added in 2022, and that's health inequities, which as I mentioned is a topic of interest to me. And this is defined as differences in health status and in the distribution of health resources between different population groups arising from the social conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. So it seems fairly um, straightforward. And you can just follow along with me, although you have access to this Excel file, but I will show you the relevant uh, data. So here in this um, column that looks most green, highlighted by the purple arrow, that's our model for health inequities. And you'll notice that it is really um, medium to dark green most of the way through. And that implies that the model is considering this to be a pretty good match. Looking at the data on the left, representing paragraphs of articles that it has chosen, these are just samples. I was very happy if I were looking for health inequities, these really would have been great articles that would have been spot on. So this is a happy example of a success. Um, using this machine learning model. However, life isn't always so peachy keen. So let's take a look at just two more very briefly. Um, another mesh term is the brain gut access. Not gonna read through the whole thing here, but just to say briefly that the brain gut access really refers to the connection between the two, and it might be related to the nervous system's connections between the brain and the gut, or for example, the gut microbiome. You're all familiar with that term now and how we have uh, so many different organisms living in our gut that, are, uh, that have a lot of functions. So if I'm interested to learn more about this brain gut access and, and whether or not there's anything in there that might be related to the human immunology, human immune system, um, we could then take a look at this column highlighted here in green, but you'll see that it's a little more wishy-washy. Some light green, some yellow, doesn't appear to be quite as good of a match. And when we take a closer look at the paragraphs for these articles, we see that many of them have only the term brain or the term gut, meaning maybe a partial match and therefore um, not really very good. But there were a few dark greens, and it may be that where the combination of the term brain and gut is used, that this is where we will have a good match, and possibly we just need to use the very top scoring 
uh, very top scores to choose the articles that we might then take a look at as just one example of what may be happening here. And the third one, um, we'll look at the MeSH term mRNA vaccines. And you all uh, became familiar with this term during the COVID pandemic. These are vaccines formulated with recombinant mRNA. You may remember that term going back to biology, which are taken up by the host cells that translate the mRNA and present these proteins to the immune system um, as antigens, proteins, in a manner similar to that that would occur during natural infection. So this induces immune, important immune responses against these encoded antigens or proteins. So it, this sounds very basic science-y to me. And so if I were trying to understand better how these mRNA vaccines were developed uh, some years before COVID hit, um, then I might take a look at this column, which is the mRNA vaccine column. Now you'll notice here that there's a lot of yellow, some yellow green, not much in the way of dark green. Well, why is that? When we looked at the paragraphs, we saw that almost all of what was given to us was about clinical trials and about the um, what happened was happening during the time of COVID. So it was as if this particular mesh heading got overwhelmed by the pandemic, just like the rest of us. So very briefly to summarize what these three models found in the articles, with health inequities, the high scores generally were on target for the inquiry. And I, as a physician looking at this would have been very happy. Brain gut access, the high scores generally were about interactions between the gut and the central nervous system, which is good. The moderate scores were more often about one or the other and would not have been useful. And lastly, the mRNA vaccines overwhelmingly found articles about clinical trials or maybe measurement of responses to vaccines as opposed to the basic science that I might have been looking for. And this is an example of bias and training data that post-pandemic articles tagged with the mRNA vaccines are mostly clinical trials of COVID-19 vaccines even though the definition of the term is biochemical. So not um, good at finding the basic research articles, this particular model. With that, I'll let Bob um, offer more discussion and thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> so um, basically we've looked at two ways to try to evaluate whether these models are working. So the the most rigorous way is to, is to label a, a test set where you take some hundreds of examples, hundreds of positive examples probably, and and more than that negative examples and, and label them and then try the model on that to be sure that what it's finding is what you're looking for. Um, but that's very labor intensive. Um, so Catherine did a, uh, a more qualitative assessment looking at a small number of models models to try to find examples of where it looks like they're working and where it looks like they're failing and maybe and speculating or uh, really hypothesizing about some of the failure modes that we might be seeing. Our problem is that we have thousands of models. So it's gonna be very hard to do any of these traditional uh, evaluations on all of these models. Uh, so we've we've, so far, we've trained 1,000, the top 1,000 models for the most common mesh terms, but there are tens of thousands of mesh terms, and there are probably many thousands of them that are common enough that we could um, hope to train a, a machine learning classifier on them. Training the models is not the problem. Evaluating the models is going to be a problem. So this is uh, one of the ideas we're working on more recently. Uh, to see if we have a quick and dirty way to to distinguish the models that are recognizing the thing that we expect them to recognize as opposed to something else. So that failure mode is is really well uh, demonstrated in the mRNA vaccines example, where the definition of mRNA vaccines is biochemical and cellular and immunological. But when you actually look at 
all the papers that were actually tagged with that, because they're all post COVID, they're all about clinical trials of COVID vaccines. So it's it's super biased toward um, just those pandemic related things, and it doesn't really cover the whole definition of mRNAs vaccines very well. So that's a mismatch between what the definition said about the about what the term is supposed to mean and what we learned about how the term is used by training the model. Well, since PubMed is so well um, curated and uh, documented, we have definitions for not every mesh term, but the vast majority of them. So we have about 30,000 definitions for mesh terms, the dictionary definitions. And those definitions are text. And what our models do is classify text. So why don't we try running our 1,000 models against our 30,000 definitions and seeing for every model where its own definition ranks? So I know that this is probably too small to see, but um, every row here is a model. So there are 1,000 rows in this Excel file. If you want to see the real Excel file, it's on that GitHub site. And this is the, this is the link to it. So there's 1,000 rows. And then we could have had 30,000 columns, but I didn't do all 30,000. I just did the for top 20. So for every model, we say, give me the top 20 matches in order for how well the, the embedding of the definition matches the coefficient vector of the model. So this is really just a matrix multiplication between that matrix of 1,000 by 768 model coefficients and the matrix of 768 by 30,000 definition embeddings. We just compute those inner products and, and then sort the rows. So I've highlighted in green where wherever a model finds its own definition. So you can see on this second row, this A549 cells, out of 30,000 definitions, its own definition was the highest scoring one. So this is a, a good match. And there's a couple others here, like the A80s, which is that genus of mosquitoes. Um, that was also ranked in number one position. And the term aging ranked in number one. And then there's a lot more of them that rank high, even if it's not a number one. So you can see that there's a distinct kind of leftward weighting of the green boxes here. But then there's a few that like, yeah, we don't see its own, like not, in the, not only in the not top 20, I. I need to add another column to this that says, where does it rank? Like, so this would be a rank of one. And we, we can't tell from looking here because it's not in the top 20, but but we know, I mean, there's a number here for where three, three prime untranslated regions, where that model ranks its own definition. So we can characterize these by basically where its definition ranks. And I think that, you know, having a high rank for your own definition is decent evidence it's also very easy to it's very easy to compute and it's probably a decent argument that this model is recognizing what we think it should recognize because it recognizes its own definition which is like the definition of what it should recognize um so i think the ones where they do score high are probably we can probably have some confidence for, with them but the ones where they don't score high we don't really know and there's basically two main ways that can go wrong is maybe the definition just isn't very good. Um, like there's no definition for male in mesh terms. So there's just no, no definition for it. So for all we know, the model could be good. It's just the definition's not good. Or the other option is maybe the, the model's bad. Like we know that mRNA vaccine model is, is just overwhelmed by the clinical trials of COVID-19 vaccines. And that's all it's gonna find. It, it doesn't really find its own definition. All right, so that's kind of where we're um, where we are, and I've got a couple of slides that discuss where we might be going next. But I think I'd rather hear feedback if anybody has questions or comments, or if you want to do some academic collaborations. So, my one of my bucket list items is I want to write an academic paper about academic papers. <laughs> I think we're well on the way here. Okay, let's see. All right, thank you for posting that link in the chat, Mar Martin. So any questions?
questions? Did anybody get the demo to run? All right, so most of the links are in this, um, the GitHub repo, and let me just show you, they may, they might be hidden a little bit. So this is the GitHub repo, and the, the link to that is somebody posted in the chat already. So when you go there, if you go to mini demo, that's where you get that link to the Google Drive, easy way to download the demo data set. I'll just show you some of the other things that are on here. Um, the examples of scaling it up on Postgres, which um, I don't have a way to make that Postgres database available for public use yet, but at least the code is there. And some of these results here, like these section heading pattern results and so forth are in Excel files. Are you, uh, sorry, Bob, are you trying to clear your screen? We're not seeing what you're... Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing anymore? No, no not right now. Okay. All right, so I just went to this PubMed classifiers um, GitHub repo. So that link is is the first thing posted in, in the chat. And the the mini demo is it is in its own um, folder here. And the readme for it has a link to the Google Drive, which is the easy way to download the mini demo stuff. You I mean the demo data set is in GitHub. You can download it here, but you have to download every file individually and it's uh, it's just easier to get it from GitHub. So, so that's like the stuff you can do on your own laptop. Uh, the Postgres, you would need a Postgres database. And the database I have has about a terabyte of data in it. So I can't really share that easily. <laughs> um, there is kind of this intermediate option. It's not like nobody's ever tried this but me. So I don't, I don't know how easy the instructions are going to be to follow, but that's in, under the um, folder called Roll Your Own Demo. And in that, um, it's mostly in Python, which is why I didn't really focus on it today. But you basically run a, a PubMed search and you download the results in XML. And then we have a Python script that will um, parse that XML and pull out tables of data that you can then use in this kind of analysis. And then I'm starting to collect these ideas of understanding classifiers, including like, like that spreadsheet for models versus definitions, um, that, that's here if you want to explore that. And we'll be you know, collecting code and so forth in, in this repo as time goes by, mostly over the course of this coming summer. That was all right, so very you... interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Is that what you expected from the abstract? Um, kind. Of, I guess I didn't completely know what to expect. I I hadn't thought about doing anything like this before, but but kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited about the idea of um, using this resource to train text classifiers, because basically section headings are a kind of labeling that people have been doing over the last thirty or forty years, and we can just kind of repurpose that for machine learning with a little bit of a uh, little bit of careful selection. I'll definitely want to read your academic paper about academic papers when it comes out. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> we still have a couple of minutes left for questions. If anyone has any. Anybody have any use cases for text class, bio, biomedical text classification they're thinking about? I haven't thought about it much, but um, I work with a lot of people who are interested in, you know, kind of taking text fields from med medical records, electronic medical records, and using it to identify treatments or diagnoses that aren't in the field where they should be, but have rather been written into a note or something. And and I I, I don't think this would work for that, but it's kind of a like 
similar idea. Yeah. So the um, I think the big challenge in um, uh, transfer learning, where you're trying to learn models in, I say it's I call it learning where the light is good because the old joke about the drunk looking for his keys under the light post, right? Um, it's not where the keys are, it's just where the light is good. So yeah. transfer learning is looking where the light is good and trying to find things that will then work somewhere else. And the problem with um, like clinical notes is that it's a very different kind of language than biomedical research. So we have a lot yeah. of this stuff that's just really kind of different. It's pretty similar actually to the scientific response documents and the, the kind of off-label use stuff, which is all based on um, biomedical research anyway. So it's not that big of a transfer in that use case, but to take it into clinical notes would be a huge transfer. Yeah. But it couldn't, not that you couldn't get any value out of it, but you have to be very careful. And I think it's one of the reasons we have to be so careful that we try to understand what the model actually is focusing on. Um, because like, if you took that, that mRNA vaccines model and you search the old literature for it, you'd say, well, that there was no work done on yeah. the vaccines back then. But there was, of course, it had to come from somewhere, right? Those existed before the pandemic, just they weren't clinically used. And so everything before the pandemic was basic research. Everything after the pandemic was basically clinical. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have a good model. Yeah. But if you know what the model uses, I mean, I think one of our little toy problems is going to be, can we train a model on the post-pandemic data that will find the basic science stuff in the pre, pre-pandemic articles? It's probably possible, but it's going to take some engineering. We'll have to like do something like, um, well, we know it's being distracted by all these clinical studies, so let's filter those out. right? And if we can just pick the, the training set, and again, this is we have a huge data set so, and we don't need a huge data set to train a model. We only need like, I don't know, maybe a hundred examples, positive examples and, and a few hundred negative examples. We can train a pretty good model on a small set, but they have to be the right ones. So that selectivity is what we need the big data for. We need to find the rare things in this in this big data set. And then maybe we can train a model that'll be good for some other targeted purpose. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're two minutes past the bottom of the hour now. Yeah, I think if there aren't any other questions, we can wrap it up. That was great. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. See you at the regular meeting tomorrow. Great. See you tomorrow. Okay. See everyone back tomorrow at 11. Okay. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>